We're going to be talking about designing upstream sites for direct measurement and remote management. So um, you're in the right place. If you came here to discover like how to use Promax 6.0 data exchange feature plus Clean Connect's real-time monitoring solution for best practice emissions measurement calculations, how to future-proof upstream sites to enable remote monitoring and management, eliminate unnecessary callouts, how to design in direct measurement that will minimize future EPA methane taxes, and how to use AI enhanced smart controllers to eliminate super emitters. So my name is Mark Smith, and I'm one of the co-founders of cleanconnect.ai. I also have a podcast called Digital Roughnecks, and in my former life, I was the founder of Windows NT Magazine, which went to over a million IT professionals. And I'm the author of the EPA cheat sheet, and I'll be covering a tad bit from the cheat sheet in today. Um, we're a hardware-enabled SaaS company with the first government-approved continuous OGI source level leak detection system, the first government-approved source level GHG intensity verification protocol, um, 2022 and 2023 Darcy Partners Top Innovators Award, and 2023 winners of the Oil & Gas Clean Tech Challenge. So I'm here with my co-founder, David Conley. Welcome, David. Hey, how's everybody doing? A little bit of background on myself. I uh, spent most of my career um, in design and engineering in the oil and gas space, primarily around production equipment um, and upstream facilities. So happy to be here and uh, excited to dive into it. Right. Hey, Justin Slagle. He's from... Uh, BR and E, uh, and uh, once you introduce yourself, yeah. So I've been with Brian Research and Engineering for about fifteen years. I am a chemical engineer, and I focus a lot on the uh, the modeling side of things and connecting models to databases. Is the the most recent venture I've been focused on. So I'm excited to to share more about that for you all here today. Right. And uh, Bert Stringer, VP, um, SiteLink. Bert, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, so been with uh, Cimarron since 2020, um, you know, leading up the service group and, and now really rolling out our real-time data monitoring uh, solution software. Uh, been in the oil and gas service industry for, geez, almost 20 years now. And uh, it's a really exciting time how we're starting to really implement uh, AI and machine learning and technology into the services side of the business. So. Excellent. Well, so why now? Why are th this particular group coming together? And, and by the way, we're going to be um, announcing officially um, a partnership that we have actually with both of these groups. Um, we just signed a deal with Cimarron and, you know, we're, we're one of the few uh, Promax partners using this new data exchange feature. But the really why now is new regulations. So as the author of the EPA cheat sheet, I track all this stuff. Literally 3,093 pages of new stuff, okay? The final rule for Quad OBC, 1,690 uh, pages, came out in December 2023. Appendix K about how to do LDAR and whatnot. The Inflation Reduction Act, which has really uh, creeped into our market big time. The new subpart W, 521 pages. Also, Colorado regs, which do influence um, the overall picture, both in terms of monitoring and measurement, and the brand new WEC, the Waste Emission Charge Preamble of Rules, just came out um, last Friday afternoon, 257 pages. You add them all up, 3,093 pages. Good news for you. I've summarized them and then even further summarized them down, um, and you're going to get a lot of that today. But... The new EPA regs, okay, so you have EPA saying, hey, you got to do source level measurement informed inventory, and there's a waste emission fee that's associated with that. Um, Colorado has the same kind of a thing. In fact, they just announced their GH fee today, and it goes backwards, meaning it's going to be based on data that, that operators collected two years ago. SEC it's going to finalize their uh, SEC climate risk reporting. Again, wanting you to measure scope one and two emissions. The EU has announced their CSRD, corporate sustainability, for operators over 500 employees. Again, scope one emissions measured. 
UN voluntary, <clears throat> which is now rapidly morphing into the MMRV, which is becoming more mandatory if you're selling into the LNG supply chain. Okay, but again, source level measurement informed inventory, and then <clears throat> different investors, you may have ESG investors or whoever, or um, even insurance companies or um, banks, finances, all wanting some sort of proof of emissions. Now the timeline on this is, is coming, th this is, I just updated this chart, but basically the new waste emission charge data collection is happening now. Literally it goes backwards, uh, it starts this year. Um, the EPA Quad OBC is published, uh, it will be, should be published by the end of this month or February. <clears throat> the alternative tech, which would be like um, vendors like Clean Connect, can then apply for an alternative tech approval at a, um, at a federal level. We've already got approval at a state level. Quad OB super emitter um, can now go into enforce because they created this new rule, which I'll go over, and they made it backwards, meaning all the way back to Quad O. And some new Quad OB Eldar kicks in this year. And then also associated gas routine flaring requirements. There's some new rules that are saying, hey, between now and when you implement your Quad OB 95% destruction efficiency, there's new things you got to do um, re regarding your flares. Subpart W, which is the empirical measurement informed inventory that uh, should be finalized by August and January 2025 is when we start the new subpart W empirical, the new um, Colorado, um, as well as even global. Um, everybody's say, hey, start measuring uh, this year. And, and our uh, technology should be approved across the whole US by January 2025. The um, first tax return is March 31st of next year. The WC report where you're turning in your subpart W measurements and there's a fee associated with it. And then you're supposed to have zero emission controllers, electronic reporting due, <clears throat> and um, you know for your initial compliance period. The state SIPs are due in January 2026. And then no routine flaring by second quarter of 2026. And then all the states will start enforcing this. Now, some people think, well, wait, if all the states aren't going to enforce all this till 2028, can't I just wait till then? No, these regulations were split up, as you see. And in fact, they even say in the new waste emission charge, we're putting this in place because we want to motivate the states to get their plans done way before this. So there will be states like Colorado who pretty much are already, their SIP is in place today. I mean, Reg 7 is already ahead of the new Quad OBC. So certain states will just move quicker, but this waste emission charge starts, you know, now essentially. Um, this affects the worldwide as well. I won't go into this as much detail, but basically even at the, if you are in the LNG supply chain or you're on a global, business, there are EU regs and global regs that also fit right into this uh, timeline. The EU says you got to start measuring in 2025 and, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, I'm not going to cover all these details or a lot of them, but what I want to say is highlight just a few things that direct measurement uh, our new measurement methods were introduced in subpart W. And so <clears throat> today what we have is everything's just an emission factor, which they now call measurement method five, but they added one, two, three, four. One being direct measurement of source, like continuous flow meter, continuous OGI. The, the key is you can measure the duration, the size, the source of that uh, emission event. And then I'll skip to three would be engineering calculations based on site equipment. And they literally call out Promax version five or higher as an acceptable method. And then a combination of the two. So if you had both your site specific Promax model and you had some level of direct measurement, you can also have this method two, which is a combination of engineering and direct and measurement. And then number four is where you have any, adding LDAR to it. So if you happen to catch a leak because you were there alive, or you can use that to shorten the duration, the default number of days duration on a leak. And then number five is what we have today, 
emission factors, okay? Now, how that could come into play, and again, this is for illustration purposes only, but if you had a cold venting event and you could directly measure it, so you saw the start time, the stop time, you could see the source, you could measure it, then you could use direct measurement and you could say, let's say that 50 kilograms of emissions were released, <clears throat> the tax on that associated, if you were to look at that isolated event, might be 75 bucks. And if you caught it before it was 100 kilograms per more, it's not a super emitter. Let's say that you had a thermocouple go off and it took 45, four to five hours before you caught it and then maybe six to eight before you fixed it, 200 kilograms was released, be a higher tax rate. And yeah, it could trigger a super emitter event, which I'll get into some more. And then um, as you work your way down in these, the less you know, so like if you did Eldar and you could say, well, I don't have to use the default 182 days um, because I did an Eldar 90 days ago, then you could shorten that. But if you can't determine the duration, the <clears throat> size, the source and all that stuff, it says, hey, we want you to use defaults, the default emission factors and the default days. And so if you add those up using the tax rate, that'd be 54,600. So you can see there's a huge incentive in subpart W and WAC and other things to say, hey, use direct measurement versus the, today's emission factors. Um, the waste emission charge goes along with that. All qualified facilities at 25,000 metric tons of CO2E need to report with a waste emission charge. You turn in your subpart W. <clears throat> and this particular year, when you so, so you have to tax day basically is March 31st, 2025. So it's 90 days after the previous year. Um, you have to turn in your report and then they give you a baseline and the baselines vary. And I have, if you use my cheat sheet, I go into complete detail about how the baseline is, but basically you can sum up all of your method intensity minus the baseline times the um, fee rate to come up with that. So there's, there is an idea of netting where if you've got some low emitting sites, you can combine them with your may were higher emitting sites and net the whole thing out to get to your tax rate, okay? And then you're supposed to retain all that detailed records for five years and the EPA can audit it. So they can literally assign an auditor to go on site and audit your records, essentially your mission records. Um, the super emitter is another one that again is all about measurement where they're sending satellites pretty much every day to look over the whole US looking for 100 kilogram per hour or more emission events. So if a third party satellite finds it, they notify the EPA and then uh, the EPA will then put that on a public website called the epa.gov super emitter. And it's supposed to be done where you, it's out there and it's the notification to the operator, but it's not public. Like it maybe just have a, a, an ID that's not exposed or something. And then five days later, you're supposed to find that super emitter. And then 15 days, you got to, you have 15 days to get up there on that portal and either say, Hey, this wasn't my leak. I can prove that it wasn't within 50 meters of my site, or, um, that wasn't really, you know, my event. Um, if you can't justify it, then basically it becomes public. And then the operator's name and ID are revealed publicly on the website. So it's kind of like you're guilty until proven innocent. Um, so, you know, again, measurement, something that's quicker, faster than the satellites and more current is what you're gonna need to do to uh, deal with super emitters. Also combustion efficiency. So the operators are gonna need to prove that you're within compliance continuously, even though they say, hey, you only have to test for efficiency every five years. They're saying, we want you to prove that you're in 95% um, compliance. They did make an, ex they, they said if you're air assisted flare, like the Cimarron Dramax, they can claim 98% combustion efficiency. And we have a, a template later on where we show you the, the difference that makes to operators when you can claim 98 versus 95% combustion efficiency. So all of that really, the bottom line is, Everything and all these different actors are saying, hey, prove your emissions. We, we wanna see source level measurement informed inventory 
and we need you to do real-time combustion efficiency. So we need remote management. So, so there's the why, the why we need to measure, why we need to um, have remote management so we can fix all this stuff autonomously in the field. So we have a three-step process. We go through monitor, measure, and monetize. And so what we do um, at Clean Connect is we do autonomous LDAR, okay? And the big idea is that we set a camera system up there. It's running all the time, tw works 24 hours, um, day or night. And so far, all of the upstream sites can be managed by a single OGI camera. And, you know, we use a digital twin tool to then, before we even get there, determine, hey, where should we place this tower? What should the height of that camera be? So that we can uh, see all the critical pieces of equipment, okay? And that way, when the operator, <clears throat> when we're setting it up, you know, we can then download all that configuration uh, content to make it easier to install. Okay. Then in addition, on a site tour level, we allow the operator to set, okay, at this angle, I want to see this piece of equipment so I can set the pan, the tilt, and I can name that zone. But even within a zone, I can then draw polygons around an object like you see here, this tank, so that when I do see a leak, I can then associate it with that specific uh, component. So you do that component monitoring, um, leak detection and quantification. So you can see here, tanks overpressuring at a couple hundred feet away. Here's one 300 feet away, 4 a.m. at night, seeing cold venting. And then um, you'll see another one that's, um, that we'll see, which is uh, loadouts. Okay, so a pumper truck shows up, maybe not that correctly and so all these the fugitive things we can uh, detect and measure and these are the kind of things we see cold venting tanks over pressuring loadouts and whatnot um, what we did to get our government approval from Colorado is we had approved source level detection blind testing um, LDAR equivalency proved that our stuff could our autonomous LDAR will be equivalent to human doing monthly LDAR. Alternative work practice, we were endor uh, operator endorsement by Civitas and PDC. And then we got EPA Region 8 approval. And we have a workflow in here where we use AI to assist detection, diagnostics, repair, verify, uh, report, and we can use that data to retrain the model. And here's our approval letter, which means that anybody who's using our stuff can use that to replace regulatory monthly LDAR, regulatory AVO inspections, regulatory tank emission monitoring. And for our Colorado clients, that eliminates up to 92% of their um, scheduled callouts. Now, the new EPA is very similar, almost identical to the Colorado Altame. This is the EPA level. The only, they added two bits to it. One is, instead of just saying source level, they're saying you have to come and improve your spatial resolution. Can you see the source of a leak at a component level, which is 0.5 meters from the source, area level, two meters, or are you just a site level? You can't see the source of a leak, but you can inspect or screen at a site level. You have to do blind testing to the spatial resolution, prove equivalency, alternative work practice, and then they added this thing, hey, it has to be commercially available. Um, you know, you, you need to be able to buy this product. And then EPA approval, once you turn in an application, they have 270 days to approve or disapprove. If you don't hear from them, I guess assume that it gets approved. Um, <clears throat> how the EPA categorizes technology is the screening technology is now spatial resolution greater than two meters from the source so it's site level so fence line monitor plane satellite zone path lasers they if you get an alert on a rolling seven days you're required to do an inspection technology which is spatial resolution of component level like method 21 handheld or like our continuous ogi which can see the source of the component of a leak. And what we had to do, this blind testing, so you can see here where we tested out to um, 120 meters with a 98% true positive, 100% true negative rate, and all these results were reviewed by CDPHE.
So, um, and then we did also did quantification results with a 78% quantification accuracy with an 8% outlier um, in, in terms of quantifying. And uh, PDC was fantastic in working with us to help us develop this product and also to help us with all, um, you know, the testing and all this kind of stuff for CDPHE. So there is the measurement side. Um, so that was monitor and now for measure where, you know, if you're using OGMP, you know, this talk about the source level measurement and reconciled with a site level. Okay. And so we're working with clients to help them do this. And this is also morphing into what's called the MMRV protocol, which builds on top of OGMP. So it has that same source site level reconciliation. But this is for um, these 20 countries who've agreed on it to say, hey, if we're going to trade LNG between each other, this is how we're going to measure the methane for that LNG that's being traded. And if someone doesn't come up or if they're over the baseline, presumably there's a tax like the EU has already announced its carbon border adjustment mechanism. So we do have a workflow um, that we help clients with OGMP. And, uh, you know, we'll show you a little bit of that. But basically, it starts with computer vision. And then we added the ability to tap into IoT device and Promax. And so Justin's going to go into exactly what this new feature that we're tapping into in real time. But what it allows us to do is to start building up this source level inventory. So we get provenance. We can measure the fugitives. We can uh, bring in all of the different meters like produce gas, fuel gas, flash gas, equipment groups, IoT devices, the weather, <clears throat> and even uh, bring in you know, the mass balance uh, reconciliation in real time. And again, our framework that we're talking about here was approved by the Colorado government. It's called Prove Zero, and it's actually written into the Reg 7 regulations. So here's an example. Justin, you sent me this of, of what a Promax live balance or mass live mass balance looks like in a Promax model. And uh, I don't know if you want to say anything about this, but. Yeah, well, for, for those of y'all that, that use Promax fairly often, which, uh, you know, I see a lot of familiar names here. Uh, you know, this is just basically leveraging the models you've already created um, or a simple model that you could easily create uh, to begin with. Uh, and then you just link it up to the data that you have that's being regularly connect, uh, collected from the field. And so then you can have a live ongoing mass balance that's always being calculated for you. So, you know, if, you know, if, if, if things are uh, up to snuff or, or not, you know, based on this simple uh, mass balance that is thermodynamically scientifically based so it's a uh, it's a provable repeatable method that you can use to prove that everything is is working correctly so justin or dave like how many devices do you need to connect back to this live model before it becomes sort of active to where you can get a, a mass balance calculation well i'd say it's not that many um, so you'd have a few instruments in the field, maybe, uh, for a production facility, you'd be, probably be looking at around 10 or so instruments, uh, maybe a few more than that. Um, and then with the additional information that, that, uh, your cameras, uh, provide, uh, that only makes it more accurate. Uh, so it's, it's something that is a, uh, it's a, it's a tool that you can, you really can only improve it you know, by pulling in more information. Yeah, absolutely. Just to add on to that, really, there's three there's three different levels of fidelity, I guess you could say, that we're looking at from a, from a modeling perspective. We're looking at metered connections and then controlled, basically metered, metered measurements, controlled measurements, and then simulated measurements. Each one of those would have a different impact on your mass balance from from what we've seen, um, and then that can be verified with the camera. Now, the interesting thing that comes into play is whenever you start enhancing the the actual combustion devices. We see a lot of like methane. There's a lot of methane slip and a lot of things like that. So whenever you add in, you know, a 
uh, a Dre Max or you get from 95 to to, to 98 percent destruction efficiency, that then you get, then you can really start making a bigger impact on your balance overall, um, and have a lot more, a lot more defensible as well. So um, we're looking at yeah three different types of measurement, all kind of uh, at different fidelity levels, um, and then um, obviously validated visually um, with every frame. So. So Manny asks, like question, mass balance on a monthly, daily, or hourly. Um, so that, you know, well, I'll answer at high level in any kind of detail, but since we're grabbing, well, I'll show you another chart or another diagram that shows how we grab the IoT data associated with Promax, but basically the answer is yes. We can get it at any level. We can do it in real time, um, mass balance, so, or near real time. So we'll show you that. Um, does Clean Connect methane detector provide PPM concentration of Promax in real time? And Promax does the mass emission calculation. So do you want to tackle that one? It's, we're not doing PPM. We're doing uh, like a flow rate of a mm. leak. Yeah. Right. And uh, as far as the components that the, uh, that Clean Connect is detecting it's detecting methane correct yes uh, we have two different two different sensors one's a methane only sensor and one's a voc sensor so it depends on the installation mm -hmm. um for bigger scale projects typically you're seeing just a methane sensor mm -hmm. um and then for you know higher higher sensitivity areas highly regulated areas you'll see a full voc so mm -hmm. it depends yeah, so it looks like it could be either way there. Uh, so that's that's excellent. Um, and uh, whenever you need a component by component, like if you need an individual component of propane versus butane or things like that, that's where the Promax part of it can be leveraged to uh, to help in that calculation as well. And right. and the nice thing is you'll have two fairly independent calculations that you can use to verify one another as well. Correct. So. That's that's a really really powerful uh, Very piece powerful. of information yeah. to 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 justify what you're reporting to the EPA. So Correct. once we have a gas composition analysis and we understand the the percentages in the stream or in the service, and then that's run through Promax, it gives us the concentration of each phase. Then pretty much any detection can be scaled to the full chain, right? Um, so you with that. With that set of data, you can pull everything from a CI score to a methane intensity to your NOx and SOx, right? It, it's kind of the, the Rosetta Stone of data sets in order to, to, really, uh, to really be able to report on anything. So, Justin, why don't you sort of dig into the um, kind of give us some inside the, uh, this new feature, this data exchange feature. Right. So based on all of these different uh, regulations and regulators, uh, basically what way everything is moving right now is that you're pretty much going to need to continuously monitor, monitor everything. Uh, that's the direction everything's heading right now. So that's where Promax capabilities are heading right now, too. Uh, so when we get into that, you know, we've got all those different scope one, scope two, and all these different regulations on this. Um, but with scope one from the SEC, uh, that one makes that one makes sense, right? You've got your flash and vent emissions. You've you've got the emissions that you're typically going to calculate, anyways. Um, and then for the scope two, you have your indirect emissions that you need to keep track of as well. So the emissions that come from the electricity generation uh, part of it that you're using that electricity. And then you've got scope three, which is probably not going to get approved by the courts. It's probably not going to get, get by, but that one is, is, is anything and everything under the sun and the kitchen sink on this one. Um, extremely difficult to quantify yeah, I mean, you're looking at the emissions of every company that supplies you the napkins in your uh, break room. I mean, it's just like everything and everything else, you know. So it's uh, it's something that pretty much call that insanity at this point. And uh, I don't think that's going to pass the snuff. 
And if it does, and uh, it's going to be everyone, uh, everyone's best guess really at, the, at that point. Uh, but using that information, we need to know who's involved in all of this. And, you know, it's going to be the, the board of directors. So ultimately they've got their, uh, their 10 K form that they need to submit to the SEC. And so you've got new positions like the chief sustainability officers that are being created now. Um, and you know these this is going to get bogged down in legal a lot now too but it's all going to come right back down onto the engineers the ehs team and the operators so we're going to need something that's going to help you keep track of all these emissions and make sure that it is repeatable and auditable as well so the methods of doing this are going to be you know, uh, you know, Mark has gone through a lot of this already, uh, but you've got the emission factors and all the different pieces that come from all the, all, all the different government agencies. Then we've got the, the protocol for the GHG, uh, and then we have the in industry associations as well. We've got emission factors with those guys. But the one that we really want to focus on is the company-specific data, and that's where we get good models, you know. We have direct measurement coming from the field. That could be a flow meter or camera. Uh, then we can put that into a simulation like Promax. Um, and then we get good thermodynamic based calculations using real data from your actual site. So then what we want to do is we want to track it. Uh, and so the way that that's traditionally been done is you have your facility and then you link that facility up to a SCADA system and then you continue on and you send that data from the SCADA system over to your historian. Well, traditionally what we do with this is then you build a model and you go by hand, uh, calculate, uh, put in all the information into your model and then by hand again, you go put that information from the model, the results from the model into an emissions historian. And that's pretty much already being done right now. Uh, but then what we wanna do is send that emissions inventory, the, in, the emissions historian information over to an emissions inventory. We wanna send it over to the 10K and we wanna send that, send that over to the ops people as well to make decisions in the field. This all is possible already. But what we are proposing here is what we want to do is we want to automate it all. Because right now, the data is manually being sent from one place to another. So uh, if you have a large number of facilities maintained, that can take a very long time, very repetitive calculations, and it's prone to human error at that point, too. If you, know, if you, if you fat finger it a little bit, you could have you know, triple the amount of emissions being reported than you actually have in, in reality. Or, or it could go the opposite direction and you could misreport it and then you can get in trouble with the, uh, with the agencies at that point. So what we want to do is we want to automate, okay? So we're going to take this automation, which will speed up our system and you'll no longer have manual data entry and you can increase the frequency of all your calculations. It's going to make it more accurate, uh, no more human error, or at least less human error. And it's a real physics-based model that you can do for it. But the beauty of it all is that it's completely transparent. You can audit all of it, and you can show exactly where the data came from, how you made the calculations, and you've got a historian that can go back as far as you need to to prove to anybody you, you need to prove it to. Whether you're a venture capitalist that needs to, to, that's looking for a buyer of your equipment. Well, if you have all this already available for whoever may be buying your equipment and your facilities, then it's all there. It's already done. It's, it makes, it makes the, the, the facility more valuable that they don't have to come up with a system for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're an operating company already, then you already have it. Uh, and uh, at that point, you need to uh, be reporting it uh, to the SCC at that point. All right, the nice thing here too is that you can have one model in a lot of cases uh, that can represent multiple facilities. 
So you don't need, if you have 800 facilities, you don't need to have 800 models. There, we have a lot of customers at this point. Well, we've got several customers at this point that have, you know, maybe about 800 facilities each, and they're using one model to represent all 800 of those facilities. And so since the model is robust enough to be able to represent several different configurations, you could just easily in the through the database just just knock it all out um, and get those calculations uh, done really easily. And then you have a company-wide emissions calculation. And you can have that daily, monthly, you can have the rolling average, rolling total, whatever you need at that point. It's your data and Promax is just there helping you calculate it along the way. David, I know you told me we're using that as well with a client where, you know, we have one model, but you can turn on and off features through this data exchange. Like, so that's a, um, we're absolutely using that. Um, so yeah, I mean, automated emissions tracking. So you want to talk to. Yeah. So at this point, you go back to the way we had been doing it, right? Uh, which is everything here except for those blue lines off to the side. Um, it was all manually done. A each step, you're manually putting it in from the OPSIS story in on down. But now you automate those parts too. You automate it from the OPSIS historian to the models. And you automate it from the models to the emissions historian. And then you automate it over to all of your emissions inventory, 10K, and then over to your operations folks as well. And that's, that is the way of the future um, with the way modeling is going to be done now. Sweet. So um, the way we use this is, um, <clears throat> so in the field, we have our cameras, we connect to uh, our edge device, we communicate with SCADA, uh, MQTT or Modbus, and we go up there. And then on the back end of their SCADA system, we're putting Promax in there. So we're feeding the SCADA data through Promax. And we also uh, link up with Cimarron's SiteLink 360 so we can get direct measurements from the field as well here. But now we can do, so if we see a leak, tank emissions, we're seeing the leak, we're measuring the leak. And again, now we can in real time sync up the data we're seeing here with that Promax mass balance. And so now we have a source level detection measurement and a site level mass balance. We're seeing the mass balance loss and we can reconcile the equivalent of like a OGMP level four and a five, okay, in near real time. But again, we're having all this data that's building up. So then you're not reporting in real time. So you may report in, in whatever you need to do, but you have the data to build that, that report. Uh, we are working with Civitas um, on all the, on all of this stuff. So with that, on the monetized side, what, you know, what is it that people want um, from our clients? They want to minimize taxes, earn carbon credits, win ESG inv investors or keep them, comply with sustainably linked loans, and bonds, and earn certified gas premiums. Um, I put this in here only from the point of view that this is coming, where you know to sell LNG you're gonna to need to build up literally from upstream, midstream, you know, the to shipping, everything, improve your method intensity in order to avoid paying a uh, border tax. So when we were building this thing, we had this big idea, this big dream to say, hey, we, we wanna be able to do remote monitoring and, you know, build it to give our clients the ability to manage by exception or managed by priority. But what if we could actually fix some of these problems remotely? And so that's why we've teamed up with Cimarron and, you know, and said, hey, do you have smart emission control devices that if we were to give you a certain piece of data, you could literally control um, that stuff in the field. So we, we put this sort of concept together. Imagine there was cold venting in the field and, you know, you were to see this kind of a thing and then be able to fix it, you know, remotely. And then, then say, hey, I fixed it, have the system go around and literally verify that it was fixed and complete the entire workflow, you know, AI assisted and, you know, eventually even autonomously. Okay, that was the big idea. And, and the whole reason why to do this is to get the operator's life back, you know, instead of being 
oh shoot, I got an alert and I got to drive out to a site and I got to fiddle with all this stuff manually and, you know, miss out on my kid's birthday party. What if we could, what if we could light a monitor and, you know, even fix some of this stuff remotely? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, our new business partner, Cimarron, and explain facility optimization. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, and it's really a great point. You know, the, the measuring and the monitoring, uh, you know, the Clean Connect and the Promax. Uh, the next piece of that is the facility optimization, and and what we what we want to do is work with that visual emissions uh, detection and utilize our equipment. Uh, and our smart devices and controllers um, to, as you said, remotely uh, fix and repair um, and ensure the optimization of that equipment. Uh, that, that's really the goal of our Silent 360 uh, suite of technology and products. Uh, this kind of gives you the major sources of super emitter events. Um, you know, we know that thief hatches and, and cold venting from flares and combustors are the main problems. And you know, to, to see that and to you know measure and 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 quantify that is a big component of this. When our controllers are added to this, it allows us to uh, eliminate those events, right? So we use the data and we're able to eliminate. That. So the suite of offerings allows us, you know, that continuous uh, measurement through the OGI cameras, uh, but then the ability to adjust and um, improve optimization and improve uh, performance of that equipment, um, you know, via, for example, via via the Draymax, right? So we're taking the real-time data back from the system and we're making those adjustments to ensure that we're achieving that 98 plus percent direct uh, destruction efficiency. Um, or the same way with, you know, tanks and VRUs where we're monitoring, uh, you know, the tank pressure and flows coming in uh, so that you can remotely uh, adjust those set points uh, to make sure that you're capturing as much gas before you combust and uh, definitely reducing and eliminating uh, those pop-off events uh, that lead to super emitter uh, type, type, type events. Um, again, so reducing the, the, the Silent 360 overall, right, is really designed around, like I just mentioned, you know, the thief hatches, uh, coal venting, uh, and, and taking in the data uh, through um, Clean Connect and or Promax or other devices and being able to remotely and autonomously adjust that equipment to function um, you know, within the design parameters. That's the main goal. A cool one is, uh, you know, again, another one of our, our upcoming uh, devices we have is ArcFlex. Um, we're currently working with customers to adjust uh, VRUs on the fly via set points and uh, autonomously uh, based on flow rates. And it's something that we're de designing as well for our VRU smart controller, uh, which definitely allows you to uh, be flexible uh, and really proactive in your approach to VRU operations uh, so that we're continually able to adjust those set points and settings uh, based on conditions in the field, uh, handling upsets better, um, and handling uh, production changes uh, better as well. So uh, that's really the, the proven part of what we're doing uh, that we're trying to take from our flares and combustors and moving that into the VRUs and coupling all that with the, with the um, autonomous 365, you know, clean connect identification of leaks. Now, this one here is a great example of Draymax. Um, you know, you, we talk about cold venting and it happens in a couple of different ways. Uh, you know, the one on the left here is, a, is, is an image where, you know, the pilot's not lit and you're just cold venting out the top. And, you know, again, with our, some of our products and technologies, right, you can uh, reduce that and eliminate that through automatically resetting, automatically adjusting, having backup and redundancy on the flares is one way. Um, and then the over aeration is another, uh, you know, big problem with uh, uh, cold venting. And that's where we're pushing too much air in air-assisted flares. And part of the reason why the EPA is saying, hey, yeah, great, it's 98, but if you don't control it and you don't monitor it, we're only going to let you go to 95% uh, DRE. And you know, using our Draymax, which has you know, been proven and tested in several basins and, and part of the ARPA DOE project, um, where we control that 
uh, that VFD and blower with site conditions automatically minute by minute to ensure that you've got proper airflow and proper combustion. Uh, you can see on the left where it's over aerated, under aerated, and then with Draymax on the far right, um, you know, how that's a clean burning 99 plus DRE flare, um, you know, using, using technology and software. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, one thing that was news to me, right, whenever we first started working with Cimarron was those flares can be on and that can be a super emitter event. And, and, right. and without, without really understanding what the data is telling you, it's, you don't actually know. Uh, so that's, a, that was, that was kind of a, a shock to me. Um, when we first started kind of getting into this was, wow, that's, that's a huge impact on operations. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And, and we've worked with several operators and they've got these controls set up and, and they've got their own, uh, you know, SCADA systems and technology to adjust and ramp VFDs. And then you go out there with a camera and you're able to pinpoint that, yeah, you're over aerating and look at all the fugitive emissions that's escaping, or mm -hmm. you're not adjusting with the uh, production levels. And so now you don't have enough flow and you're under aerating and you have the emissions there. And so yeah. um, this, this predictive algorithm, and that's the main part of this patented uh, device that really takes all of your site level data into this box and is adjusting uh, four conditions on the fly in real time. So yeah, I mean, talk about the Draymax Promax template here. Um, you know, again, getting back from the ninety-five to the ninety-eight uh, percent, and what that, what that, and I'll let one of the other guys kind of speak to this, but really plugging that Draymax in and allowing you that certainty to see what the impact is on your emissions um, and how that can affect it is really a cool deal. Yeah, so we asked Justin, because we were talking um, as we we're preparing for this webinar, like, can we illustrate a lot of the things that we're talking about in a ProMax model? I said, yeah, let me whip one up here. So we're actually going to be producing a set of templates that are going to be made uh, available free to the people that are on this webinar. So if you say, hey, I would like to model out um, for my clients or for my company what it would look like by adding you know, 98% combustion efficiency versus 95 and how that would impact your overall emissions profile. This is here. And uh, Justin, we can make this available to you as well. Any engineers who use Promax. Anything you want to say about that, Justin? No, uh, basically, if you've got a, a we'll, we'll send you a, a .pmx file of the Draymax uh, system here. Uh, you know, Bert's looked it over and uh, we, we feel comfortable sending this out to anybody that would like to use it. So um, just good old fashioned customer service here for anybody that wants it. Yeah. And I'd, I'd say that, you know, you got the template and you've also got, uh, you know, just a, a shameless plug, right? We gave everybody a, <laughs> a discount and coupon if you ordered one for your flares and combustors. So uh, you know, <laughs> definitely can help with uh, retrofitting and brownfield applications. And also putting them on uh, on new builds as well. So uh, definitely to be able to prove and document that you're 98 plus uh, on your uh, destruction efficiency is going to be key moving forward. Excellent. Um, so, David, you want to talk about this? So I'll just set it Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Yeah. You know. Well, take it so, away here. So sure. So one of the main, you know, the, one of the primary. You know, what, probably the most unique thing about this combination, right, is being at the site all the time, being able to visually verify all the time um, and and have proof um, from video evidence, right, of, of everything that we've talked about thus far. Um, but we had to have a really solid hardware set to be able to do that. And we went to the open, when we first started, we were in the open market and we used everything under the sun um, and nothing quite hit, checked all the boxes without getting kind of exorbitantly expensive. Um, you know, total cost of infrastructure creeped up and creeped up and creeped up using off the shelf stuff. So we decided um, it'd be, it would be best for our customers and for us if we developed a purpose-built sensor fusion platform in order to um, really drive autonomous 365 from a software perspective. Um, so what what you're looking at here is our patented uh, Sensor Fusion platform. 
it includes all of your includes all of your infrastructure there in that UFO, right? That UFO shaped uh, box right up there. Um, it's a plug and play platform. You plug it in, power it up, has all of your edge compute built in, and it really stabilizes everything. So it's purpose built for high high deflection rates on towers. Um, it can be optionally fit with either a methane only sensor and or a full VOC sensor. Um, and it has a really long life, you know, a mean time to failure that we expect from five to seven years. Um, and, you know, it comes with a standard, you know, bumper to bumper three year warranty. So we're excited to bring this to market this year. And, um, and this is a game changer because what it does is brings your, your total cost of implementation down dramatically by doing it on purpose, right? We're not hodgepodging anything together. We're not taking four different camera brands and four different edge compute brands. We're not, we're, we're going direct or it, it gets marked up one time and it goes right. And so um, this is, this is, yeah. So we're super excited. You know, this is probably decreased total cost of limitation by 40 to 50% um, just from a, just from a, a, a put this on our facility type thing. So, one one thing, and then we do have a lighter version. Uh, it's called a Halo, and I need to get you some updated, some updated pictures here, Mark. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, but uh, but this is the lighter version of that, um, and it and it will also support a methane only or full OGI with just a single edge compute. So if this is just you know all I want is methane detection, I don't need the full autonomous 365 suite. Then you know this is even this is even more cost effective. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, there's really three different models because it is modular. So we have the Halo, the Minerva, and then the Minerva Pro, which is you know high producing, highly sensitive, um, which is more geared around the full VOC, uh, opposed to the methane only. Um, so uh, that's the big difference between those three is what sensors you used and how many edge devices are in each sensor. So. Hey, David, I'd just like to say for, for me, right, when we first started really learning about the technology, it's not just mm -hmm. another OGI camera, right? I mean, this is no. it, this is uh, leaps and bounds above what you're going to pick up, you know, through other offerings. And to have everything built into a single package, the ease of yep. deployment, the ease of integration, and the longevity, right? I mean, that's correct. That's definitely way, way better than anything else out there. Absolutely. Yeah, and and because it had to be built for continuous use, right? right. Most uh, most off the shelf, um, off market OGI solutions are you turn them off, you turn them on, you run them for an hour, do an inspection, turn them off, charge the batteries, turn it back on. Right? It's very manual. Um, but this was no, this is on twenty four seven, three sixty five, inspecting a facility anywhere from twenty to sixty times a day, depending on the facility. So you're going from uh, yeah, you're going from one inspection a month to 60 per day, right? And that that's that's a huge leap right there um, in terms of level of granularity and fidelity that you that you get out of the data. Uh, but but it had but the hardware had to work, right? And and the hardware had to uh, be able to support that use case, which is um, you know in now in demand, right? That's kind of the the new industry standard is changing and the and it's a clean connect system right and so that's what we're really excited about um to, to really make an impact on operators ability to to function and stay you know stay in business stay ahead of everything and um and to the, to the EPA's point yeah to the yep. EPA's point it has to be something that's commercially available already right this is not pie Absolutely. in the sky stuff this is stuff that's proven and yep. ready 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 to ready to help people and, Absolutely. You know, we also didn't go into a lot of the other models, but when we talk here, it's usually a combination. So, you know, we have gas leak, but we also have liquid leak, PPE detection, fire, smoke, security, all kinds of other things. So generally speaking, yeah, you know, we talk about, you know, regulations, but really it's ops that ends up being one of the major funders of what we do. Um, solving the ops problem. Yes, we do solve the compliance issue. And yes, we also help the sustainability people, but we're very ops friendly uh, because of the combination of things that they want to do, essentially putting a full-time inspector on a site. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things that 
you know, we like to say is sort of like this visual, this combination is key, visual remote monitoring. Okay, so you're seeing it visually and you can measure it and get that data back, real time measurement, and then the ability to manage the stuff in the field, right? So we don't just monitor it, but we can literally tweak stuff in the field through like Cimarron and whatnot to, to don't just go alerting you for super emitters, but literally prevent super emitters potentially. And then, you know, be able to take all that data and use it to monetize. So we have some clients who are literally earning a premium for their product, not just have the data for reporting as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, the bottom line is that, you know, with these new rules, you know, without Clean Connect, you just got a whole lot more manual inspections to do. Uh, I, yeah. Back of the envelope, about 470% more. Um, hey, that's that's yeah. wild. I, I do have just a, one quick thing I want to, just out of respect for time, we get yeah. we have a, a backlog of questions that yeah, I, why I, we, I why think I would, those? Yeah, I think I would just start going through. This one's from Max. Is DRE monitoring available for enclosed combustors, um, Bert? I, am I on mute here? No, not not no, currently, you're... but that's something that we are actively working on right now. Uh, flares we've got knocked out and perfected uh, and ready to go, but enclosed combustors is, is one that we're working on now. Awesome. Um, from Jana, for Simron, uh, what about O2 monitoring? Um, since much, since midstream sh uh, shuts in facilities for high O2, which is commonly caused by VRU pulling too much or response time. Yeah, and so that's another one where, you know, you have an extra sensor or two and you're able to remotely adjust or automatically adjust those set points uh, so that you're not drawn in too much through your tanks. Uh, and then that you also have those O2 sensors at the VRU that shut it down when that's not present. You're able to automatically kick back on, restart. You've been in recycle mode this whole time, and you're ready to produce gas again, so or capture gas again. So that's easily accomplished. O O2 is, is an easy one to, to, to take care of. Awesome. From Robert Beeler, what kind of data security, uh, data proprietary considerations were taken into account while developing the Minerva AI? Uh, does running the data through Minerva AI cause a change of custody to Clean Connect or AI program? itself for developers. I think this is a question kind of around the data itself. Um, operator data stays operator data. I think that's going to answer your question. Um, and, you know, we use per permission, with permission, we use data to improve models and make sure that everything stays uh, running and, and great, but i um, happy to talk more offline. SOC 2 with, type from, 2. Yeah, from, a, yeah. from just a standards, standards um, perspective, it's all SOC 2 type 2 compliance, ISO 27001. Uh, we, you know, we can provide evidence uh, around those different certifications. Uh, from Manny, uh, can you speak to reporting to state and federal agencies and how to keep one version of the truth for emissions and measurement? How do you handle prior period adjustments that correct the measurement data? Jason, this, or this sounds more like a, uh, Justin, this sounds more like a question for, for you. Ah, I was Maybe thinking not. it was going to be more like a Mark question. <laughs> yeah, Maybe, yeah. <laughs> they, they are okay. So, in because they actually do allow this, and in fact, they call this out. So, so you have your data that you have, and and if you will, each of these different groups, CDPHE or Reg or you know Subpart W, or whatever, they're all adding a slight little innovation. Well, there was a new innovation added. Uh, so, for example, Subpart W would say, "Hey, when you're when you're showing a calculation of a particular equipment thing, put the number in there. Is it, did you use method one, two, three, four, five? So now that you have this idea that you could mix and match methods, you could say, hey, I can't do direct on this thing. So I, it's level five, it's method five, and it was method one. Okay, so that's important. But then uh, the uh, W, the WEC actually has this idea of adjustments. So they even put a different date. You're supposed to turn in your, return, so to speak, your missions return on March 31st. However, they allow for adjustment period up to November 1st. So you can turn an adjustment and then reconcile the two things. The, the big key thing with our data is it's all time series sequenced, right? So you can, um, you know, you, you can roll back, you can look back over different times sequences 
you know, to to get the right data for for that kind of a thing. Um, I could imagine it would be tricky to go between years, but you know, the like for example, they start off with Clean Connect, and now they want to add in data from a previous year. Um, I don't have the answers for all the details there, but there is a there is a mechanism to do some of these adjustment period um, in the WEC, the waste and, emission and charge. I could also speak on the on the Promax side of things. You could, if you have, if you realize like, oh wow, my meter was, you know, not calibrated for this period of time, and and once I calibrated it correctly, these are all my right you know, flow rates and things like that. Yeah. If you needed to go back in time and rerun a bunch of stuff, you can actually do that as well. Um, it's a very right. easy uh, uh, method of doing that. Uh, so I, I I, would, you know, if that is more of what you're talking about, then we can definitely help with that too. Wonderful. Um, Jess, why don't you take James and Greg's questions, which are okay. more Promax related. Yeah, so James was asking, uh, you know, uh, uh, for the one model for all facilities, what about facilities that have different equipment and operate at different conditions? Um, you know, he said he brings up wet gas, dry gas wells, uh, wells that produce oil and wells with uh, with a little bit, uh, only a little amount of fluids. Um, so that, that's actually a, a, a Promax is robust enough to, to to take care of all those different scenarios. And you can quite literally just turn on and off equipment um, as long as you configure it to be able to route in one direction versus another direction. And you have one direction has this type of equipment in it, another direction has the other type of equipment in it. Um, and you can have so many different types of configurations all uh, configured in one model. Uh, so it's all achievable. Everything you brought up in that question is all achievable. Um, and it's it's pretty straightforward as well uh, when you connect it up with the database. And then Greg brings up um, threshold limits um, in the mass balance calculations. Uh, so basically, can you set a limit um, for what your thresholds are and then be notified or, or somehow know uh, when you exceed those? There are limits that you can set inside of Promax. I know that there are limits inside of databases as well that can trigger certain activities based on uh, certain uh, uh, limits being exceeded as, as well. So that is something that you can do. And then as far as yep. your second question here, can that threshold be time weighted hourly, 24 hour, et cetera? Uh, yes, it can be. Um, there are averages, uh, any types of averages you want. It can be daily, uh, weekly, monthly, whatever type of average you need to do. Uh, you can set those inside of Promax proper. And then also, if that doesn't tackle everything that you need, you can even do that on the database side uh, as well to make sure you cover all your bases. Yeah. And an interesting, just a, just a caveat to that if we're having an upset imbalance or if we're having an imbalance just upset conditions in general that can be visually verified right if, mm -hmm. if i'm hey i have an right. i have an upset in my balance it's on my you know phase one you know uh you know we're going to see elevated emissions or an actual actionable data or actionable alert come through um on the on the ogi side of things so <laughs> It's, it's the combination can add, you know, fidelity to that, you know, uh, so. Yeah. And, Our and question for Simran, I'll oh, go ahead. I was going to say that that next question ties into that as well. So yep. uh, utilizing, you know, the machine learning analytics where we're getting more predictive when you're going to have a failure that could lead to an emissions event kind of ties mm -hmm. into that entire threshold as well. So keeping yeah, the, the question, equipment optimized. So Yeah. And the question and the question that, first referring to was, can you predict also failures with the data that you're gathering? So can you get into going from reaction to prediction? Exactly. Um, the answer, so that's the, the answer to that is definitely. Yeah, the answer to that is yes. Yes, absolutely. But wonderful. That's all the questions that came well, through. I think, is there one left in the, oh, okay, never mind. No, I guess we're good. Excellent. Awesome, awesome guys. So what, are, what we're going to do, um, you know, we've got some ideas here for engineers about the different things you could design a new site and things like that. But we'd be helpful to 
I'm going to be sending out a replay notice to all this. And I'm going to be, um, and so, and I'm going to give a, an opportunity that if you respond and say, Hey, I'm interested in some of these pro max templates that you mentioned, um, I'm going to put other resources in there. For example, like the EPA cheat sheet for those who haven't seen that, um, other things that we've got coming up. So there's going to be the replay link plus a bunch list to a bunch of resources. plus an opportunity to book a uh, one-on-one time with, um, you know, our engineering consulting team to, you know, get into your specific situation. But yeah, cause, cause Simron and us, like we've got a three day pilot where we'll literally go out to your site, show you everything we've shown you in a very quick amount of time. So with that, um, I would like to say thanks to my panel for being yeah. here and answering all these questions thanks. and thanks for yeah. everybody showing up, bringing your questions and and uh, learning more about uh, direct measurement and remote management. So, yeah. and I knew, and I know we threw a lot out there, right? And so, and there's so much more granularity and detail we can get into one on one. So please feel free to reach out if any any of us on the panel here, and we'll be happy to happy to help. Yeah, excellent. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks everybody. Thanks all. Appreciate Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.